So what I'm going to talk about today is the concept of carbon negative energy and on a broader sense than just talking about Cool Planet as a company. So the question is, you know, what the heck is carbon negative energy? Well, we're trying to address you know, the big problem facing humanity, which is rapid climate change. And all of you in the room should know that uh, we've had a stable CO2 level for a thousand years, and recently, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, it's shot way up, and that, of course, has caused uh, global climate change. So the temperature is now projected to go up by as much as five degrees Fahrenheit, and there are several experts that are claiming that could be the end of civilization. So carbon-negative energy is a very powerful tool to reverse global warming. So uh, how is this possible? Well, we need to look at the data for the CO2 level in the atmosphere. And this is collected in Hawaii at high resolution. And the blue line is the trend line. And you can see it's up to about 390 parts per million, a very bad number. But more interestingly, we have this red fine structure that there's an annual cycle to the CO2 level of the atmosphere. And why is this? This is because in the summertime, plants in the northern hemisphere absorb CO2. And there's much more land mass in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere. So you don't get a repeat on the southern hemisphere. So when plants are growing and photosynthesis is going on, we're actually reducing the CO2 level in the atmosphere. But in the wintertime, when these plants go dormant and annuals die, then this is all dumped back into the atmosphere. So we're not really collecting CO2 out of the air on a permanent basis with plants. We're just storing them temporarily and dumping them back in. So to go into this a little further, here's some basic carbon cycles. Now, the one on the left is the standard fossil fuel cycle. You dig carbon out of the ground, you pump oil, you burn it in your car, all that carbon goes into the atmosphere. It's 100% fossil carbon. That's the big problem. Uh, things that we've talked about at this conference, solar, wind, hydro, and so on are carbon neutral. Well, that's nice, but they can't do anything about all the carbon we dump in the atmosphere. Your electric powered car on, powered by solar cells will not take any carbon out of the atmosphere. It just reduces the rate of increase of global warming. And that isn't good enough anymore. So then we go to carbon neutral. Uh, trees, plants, and annuals in particular die every year and dump all their carbon back into the atmosphere. Trees. I have respiration, they emit carbon dioxide at night, they emit carbon dioxide in the wintertime, branches and leaves fall off, and of course when they die, all that carbon goes back in the air. So biomass is not really sequestering carbon long term. So that brought us to bring, uh, to put together a true carbon negative cycle, the cycle on the right. So what we do is we intercept carbon from fast growing plants and we route some of it to food and fuel production, but we take part of it that would normally rot and we make it into sequestered carbon that stays in the ground for hundreds of years. And that way, whatever process we're running, food or fuel process, becomes car carbon negative instead of carbon neutral. So we can actually offset all the fossil fuel that's being dumped in the atmosphere. So another little factoid you need to know is there are two kinds of photosynthesis. C3 photosynthesis is in the normal plants that you see out your window here. But there are a few notable exceptions. There are a few plants that use a much more efficient C4 photosynthesis cycle. Most notably, corn, switchgrass, sorghum, sugarcane, and misacanthus. And these plants can grow 20 feet per year instead of two or three feet per year. So, they can capture 10 times as much carbon per unit area than the plants you're used to, okay? But they're mostly annuals, and they die off in the wintertime, so all that carbon gets dumped back in the atmosphere. So we have these fabulous carbon-absorbing antenna out there in nature that we're not making any use of, okay? So we can bury the carbon. Well, I went around to lots of venture firms and lots of big corporations and said, well, I, I'll bury the carbon as hard coal. It'll stay in the ground for hundreds of years. And they said, well, nobody's going to go for that because nobody will, society will not do anything that's not profitable. You've got to come up with a profitable reason for doing something with the carbon. So coincidentally, there's been a big movement in biochar research. And we had the honor this year of sponsoring the U.S. Biochar Initiative Conference in Sonoma, 
We had 350 attendees. We had standing room only at many of the scientific sessions. And we found that there are 93 universities around the world that are doing biochar research. Well, why are they doing it? Well, they're doing it because of these pictures here. That's the Hawaiian study with ferns. You have the controlled, you have the control plus fertilizer, and you have the control plus biochar and fertilizer, and you get three times as much plant mass. Here's a Japanese study. Soil plus, and soil plus nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, that's NPK, or soil plus biochar plus NPK. Huge difference. And you go down the line, as we have in our laboratory, and you take a plant controlled with fertilizer and water, and you add biochar to it, and you get a huge increase in plant mass. You can get two or three times as much food. That leads people to think that, wow, biochar is the greatest thing since the wheel. Okay? Well, there's bad news. The bad news is that that's about a third of the studies. Uh, Two-thirds of the tests that people do in laboratories end up with little or poor results, but they don't publish the negative results. So that leads you to con conclude that this is maybe the greatest thing since the unicycle, not the greatest thing since the wheel, because you get fabulous results, but it's erratic. Okay? So we've put a huge amount of effort into solving this problem as part of our overall energy fuel production at cool planet energy systems, and we have developed a, what we think is a very reliable biochar to soil enhancer, and we start over on the left with a scan electron microscope picture of the biochar. That's what it looks like in the middle when it's been converted to a soil enhancer, and those are the kind of consistent results you get. And in particular, there's three big areas of concern. One is pH stability, a biochar that you get out of some sort of gasifier process. Uh, has the wrong pH to be planted in the ground, and you can age it, you can put buffers in it, but over time it tends to drift. So you'll put it in the ground and initially you'll get some good results, but then in a few months it'll be poisoning the soil. So we've developed special techniques to stabilize it. The second one is that if you make biochar in the wrong way, you do it at too low a temperature or you use direct fired instead of indirect fired, you can get uh, polyaromatics on the surface, and they can leach out, and polyaromatics are on the EPA most wanted list. So uh, you need to be careful about that. So uh, you have to control the process very carefully so there's no contamination. And then third is water retention. Uh, a big feature of the biochar as a soil enhancer is it holds water by the roots, water and nutrients. So if you don't hold enough water and nutrients by the roots, you don't get this big gain in productivity but you can actually make the char too good, so it actually holds onto the water too tightly, and it absorbs it, but it doesn't put it back out to the roots. So there's a balance that you have to do there in order to make the water and nutrients uh, plant accessible. And these things we have made tremendous progress on. There's always more work to do, but I was just awarded a patent on this uh, just in the last few weeks, and it's a key, a key part of uh, Cool Planet Energy Systems.